Have you ever traveled with children? I know the answer to that question. Yes, you have. And normally you take that children and you squeeze them into the back seat of your car. Or if you have a larger vehicle, if you have a minivan, the children are relegated to the second and the third row and they are all strapped in. Once upon a time, as children riding in the back seat, all you could do was stare out the window at the scenery, maybe play a game of I Spy or license plate bingo, or maybe you had a few books along that you could read. That was once upon a time. Now, maybe as children are in the back seat of the car, they, they have their own screen and they're able to, to pull things up and read or they're able to be texting some of their friends or they may even be able to stream some video. However, nevertheless, there always comes that moment of, of certain boredom. Stuff can only keep you busy for so long until someone says, Stop looking at me. Stop looking at me. What? I'm not, I'm not looking at you. Yes, you are. You're staring at me. And you're looking at me with your eyes. Oh, yeah. Dad, tell him to stop looking at me. Tell, Mom, tell him to stop looking over here in my direction. This is my space. That's her space. Don't look at me. Have you ever had that conversation in your car. Once upon a time, my mom was, was driving the car and, and in the back seat on one side is Sean, on the other side is Todd, and, and we're going down the road running some, some sense of, of errands. And there came the moment where, where this conversation started. We weren't pinching, we weren't punching, we weren't hardly saying anything, but, but someone looked at someone else and it started that whole conversation. Stop looking at me, stop staring at me. And, and my mom, God bless her, she could just block us out. She could pay no attention to us. And, and all this conversation happening in the back seat until finally, ah, we broke her. Yeah. Until, until finally we got her attention and she had had enough of this. Don't look at me. And with one hand on the steering wheel and with another arm reaching into the back seat, she was doing all she could to find somebody to grab. But we were ahead of her and, and we were able to hide and we were laying on the floor because you didn't have to wear your seatbelts at that time, right? Until all of a sudden we realized as mom was reaching for us, the car was headed toward the ditch on that side of the road. And as we screamed, out and as mom overcorrected, we agreed, don't tell dad, right? <laughs> but there are times when, there are times when we, when we stare at other people. There are times when, when we look at other people. And there are some times when people want to be stared at. So there are some people who, who, who seek the attention. There, there are some people who, who, who want others staring at them and, and looking at them for, for whatever reason. But as Paul speaks to us in this letter of joy this morning, he's going to share with us that there, there are, are wrong reasons to stare at people. There are some wrong reasons to be, to be looking at people. But there is one right reason. There is one right reason to look at someone. And that is when that person is reflecting, say it with me, is reflecting Jesus. We want to see those people who are reflecting Jesus and even more important, we are called to be those people who reflect Jesus. Towards that end, Paul writes it this way by the power of the Holy Spirit. Philippians chapter 3, beginning at verse 1, listen to the word of God. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. Say those four words with me. Rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. 
If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I've made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. If anyone would look at us, we want them to see Jesus. If anyone were to look in our direction as those who confess to be followers and disciples of Jesus Christ, we want them not to see us, but we want them to see the reflection of Jesus. Because it is through the work of Jesus alone that we are forgiven of our sins. Amen, church? And so the first group of people that Paul is going to point out to us this morning are those who believe in, number one, righteousness by ritual. Would you say that with me? Righteousness by ritual. Now hang on to that category of people or, or write it down. Paul begins writing this morning and, and he reminds us, he says, hey, brothers, verse one, rejoice in the Lord. Remember, this is a letter of joy. And when you have the joy of Jesus in your life, it causes you to rejoice. And Paul is reminding us that, that the Lord Jesus Christ is the source of all of our joy and all of our confidence. It is because Jesus lovingly agreed to the will of his Father in heaven. Jesus so loved the Father that he was born into this world, that he lived in this world, ministered in this world, that he suffered and died in this world, that he was buried, but that on the third day he rose again from the dead. His body physically resurrected by the power of the Holy Spirit. And 40 days after that resurrection, we celebrate Ascension Day last week. He ascended. He returned to the glory of heaven and the right hand of God the Father. And he, at just the right time, is going to come back to gather all of those so loved by God. Amen, church? You see, that is our joy. That is why we rejoice it's because our forgiveness, it's because our righteousness is all received through the exclusive work of Jesus. But there were some who did not have joy in Jesus. There are some who did not rejoice in Jesus. There were some who believed that, that being right with God was a righteousness done by ritual. And concerning those folks, Paul says in in verse one, continuing down there, he says, to write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Paul says, I've already spoken to you about these folks who believe in righteousness by ritual. And yes, he did that back in chapter one, verses 27 through 30. And uh, Paul says, don't worry about it. It's good for me to repeat it once again. And it is absolutely no problem. And so he talks about those folks given to righteousness by ritual in verse 2. He says three things about them. He says, look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who, who what? Who mutilate the flesh. Paul provides three strong rebukes and three strong insults for those who believe in righteousness by ritual. Now, the first thing he does is he refers to them as dogs. Now, how many of you have a dog? By a show of hands, how many of you have a dog? All right. How many of you have a miniature dog? 
How many of you have like one of those teacup dogs, right? They can't even hold the door open, right? Yeah, they curl up in your bed and you're afraid you're going to roll over on them. Yeah. Well, that's not the kind of dog that Paul is talking about here. He says, watch out for these dogs. That was about one of the most slanderous things you could say at that point in time. Dogs roamed the streets. Dogs were vicious. Dogs were not owned. Dogs were, were ruthless animals to be feared in the life of the city. And these who are given to, to righteousness by ritual, Paul calls them dogs. He calls them also evildoers. You see, they think they're righteous. They, they believe they're doing righteous things and keeping all these rituals and rules and, and, and traditions and ordinances. And Paul says, uh-uh, he's not a single one. He says, you are given to evil. What you do is evil and it's only evil all the time. He also refers to them as being mutilators of the flesh because they gave so much emphasis to that outward symbol of circumcision. But Paul does not use the word for that outward symbol of circumcision. He uses the word to mutilate, to nearly castrate. He says, you know what? You may have that outward symbol upon you, but it has absolutely no connection to your heart, no commitment in your heart. And he calls all of these folks out. Righteousness is not received or given through ritual. In fact, talking about circumcision, Paul goes on to verse three. He says, for we are the circumcision who worship by the spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and, and put no confidence in the flesh. He says, you know what? It, it's not your ritual that is saving you. You are not the ones who are standing right before the one true God. He says, we are because we have been convinced and convicted by the power of the Holy Spirit. Our lives have been changed. We have surrendered. We have given ourselves fully over and we glory in Christ Jesus. We do not put our confidence in the flesh. We put our confidence in Jesus Christ. Amen, church? And Paul goes on. He says, all right, I, I still, I, I don't think you're getting it yet. Those of you who believe in righteousness by, by ritual. He said, you think you're so good. He said, you know what? I'm better than you. He says, if ritual really matters, if tradition really matters, if it's all about reputation, if it's looking a, a, a certain way on the outside, if it's about having this, this uh, reputation in the community, Paul says, mine is way better than yours. He brings us in at verse five. He says, you know what? I was circumcised on the eighth day. My parents kept the law of Genesis 17, verse 12. On that eighth day, they followed through. I am of the people of Israel. You know what? I go all the way back to Father Abraham as I trace the lineage of my life. I'm of the tribe of Benjamin, one of the elite tribes, a part of the southern kingdom. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. I have the right parents. I have the right pedigree that continues to work its way out. As to the law, I'm a Pharisee. I am a legalistic fundamentalist. I do not miss a single detail because every T is crossed and every I is dotted. As to zeal, I'm a persecutor of the church. I stood over and I held the cloaks of those who stoned and put Stephen to death. I spent all my time rounding up those who I believe were against God so that they could suffer and die. As to righteousness under the law, Paul says, I was blameless. Paul says, you want to talk about standing in the community? You want to talk about ritual? You want to talk about tradition? You want to talk about keeping all the right laws for, for people to see so that you look so good on the outside but have absolutely no commitment in the heart? Paul says, I was that man. That's who I was. But righteousness is not received through ritual. Can we agree to that, church? Amen. Righteousness, right standing before God, forgiveness and grace comes not when we look at those who, who are supposedly righteous by ritual, but we look to the one who is, number two, our resurrected redeemer. Say that with me, our resurrected redeemer. 
You want grace, you desire forgiveness, you desire to be right with the one true God, you desire to confess your sins, look to and look at the resurrected Redeemer. We jump right back in at verse seven. Paul says, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. He says, you know what? I had all the credentials. I had all the reputation. I was the man. People looked to me. And he says, you know what? I'm giving all that up. I am giving absolutely all of that up. My credentials, my my training, my, my standing in the community. It is nothing to me in light of the person and the work of Jesus Christ, of seeing him and knowing him and trusting him as Savior and Lord. Verse eight, indeed, he says, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Wow. Paul is willing to surrender absolutely everything. This life that that he had built for himself in the past, this reputation that he had created for himself, letting it all go. Would you be that willing? You see there... There are probably some of us, there are probably a few of us here this morning who would agree with with Paul's pedigree from verses five and six. There are some of us here this morning who would say, "Well, well, yes, people do know my parents. In fact, people still talk about my grandparents. I mean, I've been a part of of this community for for." For generations, I mean, this, everyone here knows my family. They know who we are. They, they know what we do in the community. They recognize our standing. They, they know the things that, that we are a part of. They know the activities of, of our lives. We are highly revered and highly respected people. That's, that's, that's our reputation. And for some of us, we believe that's our faith. And we would do, or we might invest everything into keeping that reputation and believing that that such traditional standing, believing that such ritual, believing that, that, that such talk of us in the community is more important than our relationship with the resurrected Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Paul says in verse 9, For his sake, for Christ's sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Paul says, I don't want all that stuff. Paul says, you know what? I can sit here and I can think about what my life was once upon a time. I walked around and and, and people just cleared the way and they made the way for me. People wanted to to shake my hand. People wanted to congratulate me. I had such a job. I had such a standing in the community. I had had resources beyond what, what I needed. I had everything. He says, you know what? Forget it. Because ultimately all of that was nothing more than a distraction that was keeping me away from a full relationship with Jesus Christ. I have suffered the loss of all things and I count them as rubbish. You know the word for rubbish? This is a polite word that you find in your ESV version. The Greek word for this is manure. And if you spend any time farming, I don't have to say any more to you in terms of what manure is. Paul says, you know what? All of that stuff from the past, it's manure. It's rubbish. He goes on to verse 9. He says, Be found in him, be found in Christ, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness of God that depends on faith. I will never be right with God by following all these little rituals, all these little traditions, and and just trying to keep enough laws to, to make myself look a little bit better on the outside. That will be a wheel that you spend your life spinning that goes nowhere. 
Paul says the only way to be right with God is through the one way, the one truth, and the one life that is Jesus Christ. Do you truly want to be a co-heir of the righteousness of Jesus Christ? If you do, then it is by the power of the Holy Spirit convincing you in your heart. It is by that gift of faith that that one bows down before God and confesses his sins, confesses her sins. It is a surrendering of life. It is an acknowledgement that, that Jesus has to lead and that Christ has to be the only one that I trust. Can you agree that that's you this morning? Can I? Can we truly say that is who we are? Or could it be that some of us are still hanging on to a little bit of ritual? Some of us are still hanging on to a little bit of tradition. Some of us are still convinced that it's by keeping certain laws that we on our own are gaining salvation. God is clear. Righteousness and forgiveness are not by ritual. It is by faith alone, in Christ alone, and in his shed blood it is by the resurrected Redeemer that we are forgiven of our sins. Amen, church? Can we agree? Amen? If that's true, and I pray that it's true, I pray that you have given your life to the resurrected Redeemer who is Jesus Christ, the one and only Son of God. If that is true, then we now have the opportunity and we actually have the challenge placed upon our lives to be those who, number three, reflect. Say that with me. Who reflect. We are to be such women and we are to be such men who reflect everything that is so beautiful about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul goes on in verse 10. He says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. I want to know Jesus Christ. I want to know the strength and power of his resurrection. And as people look at you, do they see Jesus Christ? And do they see the strength and power of his resurrection? Because if you've confessed your sins, if you have received Jesus Christ, you have the power of the Holy Spirit who is indwelling you. If you are a woman or a man who is in pursuit of Jesus Christ, you are no longer going to be the one you were before. You cannot be who you were if you now are in Christ. Amen? Uh, you cannot be who you were if you now are in Christ. Amen? You have to get rid of that old flesh. You have to flee that old stuff. You can't be a part of that. You can't go there. You can't associate. You see, we're too interested in trying to keep a toe in, in, in both waters a foot in both worlds. We still kind of like a little bit of that old flesh. And we're not necessarily committed fully to being that new man or that new woman in Christ. Paul says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. The power of his resurrection is victory over who you once were. And now by the power of the Holy Spirit, it is living and being who you are in Jesus Christ. You are a temple of the Holy Spirit. You are purchased and paid for by the most important of prices. And that's the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Is that what people see? Or do they still see that old woman? Do they still see that old man? Do we sound just like we did? Do we live just like we did before? Is our address still sin? Paul says in verse 10, and, 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 and may, I, may, may we share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Share in his sufferings. This one weeds a lot of people out. You see, if, you're, if we are really going to reflect 
Christ. We're called to share in his suffering. Let me ask you this question. Did, did Jesus suffer? Some of you don't know the answer, but you can trust your neighbor. Did Jesus suffer? Yes. He went all the way to the... Before he arrived there, they were mocking him. They were rebuking him. They were whipping him. They were filleting his flesh with their whips. And yet, as a lamb is silent before its shearer, so was he. Jesus suffered. And Paul says, may we share in his sufferings. You see, if Jesus went all the way there for me, and if Jesus cried those tears on the cross for me, what will I do? You see, he did all that while we were still busy sinning. And there is a world that is busy sinning. Are we busy suffering in the name of Jesus to reach that world that doesn't know him yet? People who are broken and don't even know it. People who are hurt and who are trying to drink it away. People who are stressed and are trying to smoke it gone. People who want to escape from life a little while, so we'll just pull some handles and play the game. It's their life, right? Jesus gave the responsibility to us to go and to make disciples. Jesus gave the responsibility to us with the power of the Holy Spirit to be the ones who reach and who share and who listen just like he did. How much of that is reflected in my life? How much of that is reflected in our lives? How much of that is reflected in this bride of Christ? Do people see Jesus in us? I pray they do. I pray they do. One more, and then we're going to wrap up. Righteousness is not by, by keeping some form of, of ritual or external symbol or, or law to appear good on the outside. Forgiveness and, and reconciliation of sins, being right before God, is, is, is only when we look to and confess and believe in by faith our resurrected Redeemer, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We then want to reflect all that he is, all that he has said, all that he has taught. And, and we also, number four, finally, we want to be people who are resolved. Say that with me, who are resolved. We want to be a people. We want to be a church. We want to be the bride of Christ who is resolved, who is determined, who is committed, who is agreed to make much of Jesus Christ. We get to the end of this argument. We get to the end of this presentation. We see Jesus and we know the task and the privilege and the responsibility that has been set before us. And it's by the power of the Holy Spirit that say, we are resolved. And we will not quit on this. We will not abdicate this responsibility to someone else. We will not say, I'm too young. We will not say, I'm too old. We will not say, I am too busy. We will not say, I am too weak. We're going to be people who are resolved for the glory and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Verse 12, not that I've already attained this or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. 
Because of everything that Christ Jesus has done for the Father in reaching our lives, we now have the opportunity to be so resolved that we are going to press on. Say that with me, to press on. We're going to press on in loving obedience to work out our salvation and to reach lives that are still lost. Jumping back into scripture at verse 13. Brothers, I do not consider that I've made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. You are not here this morning to hide in a building. Your faith is not something that you celebrate every once in a while, maybe on a Sunday. Your confession of faith in Jesus Christ is not merely a certificate that you hang on a wall or put in a drawer. As those who reflect the resurrected Redeemer, Jesus Christ, we are called to be men and women. We are called to be a church that is resolved to continue to press into this greatest of responsibilities. And if you're not that resolved this morning, then I would ask you, what are you resolved to? If you are not committed fully to God this morning, then I would ask you, what are you committed to? Because if we are committed to anything else, if we are committed to anyone else, if you're kind of in, but not really, you're out. And that's a wake up call for me. as those who reflect Jesus Christ. We need to be resolved with heart and soul and mind and strength because lives and eternity are depending on it. Amen, church? Amen. These closing words from the song, Knowing You. All I once held dear and I want you to think about Paul. All I once held dear and built my life upon, all this world reveres and wars and fights to own. All I once thought gain, I've counted loss, spent, worthless now compared to this. Do you know? Do you believe in? And do you reflect Jesus? Pray with me. Heavenly Father, may it be true. At times we prefer the ritual. At times we prefer the tradition. At times we prefer to just try to fit into the role and the part for a little while. To avoid the questions and maybe to placate some of our thoughts and feelings. But have us to understand this is not a game. And Father, as your word says, reveal to us all that needs to change, that you alone can change by the power of your Holy Spirit. Father God, thank you for Jesus, our resurrected Redeemer. Help us to believe, help us to receive, and help us to reflect all that he is, bringing the light to shine so well in the darkness. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen.